DiscerningHearts.com presents Villains of the Early Church and How They Made Us Better Christians with Mike Aquilina. Mike Aquilina is a popular author working in the area of church history, especially patristics, the study of the early church fathers. He is executive vice president and trustee of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, a Roman Catholic research center based in Steubenville, Ohio. He is a contributing editor of Angelus Magazine and general editor of the Reclaiming Catholic History series from Ave Maria Press. He's the author or editor of more than 50 books, Villains of the Early Church, the book on which this series is based. He has hosted 11 television series on the Eternal Word Television Network and is a frequent guest commentator on Catholic Radio. Villains of the Early Church and How They Made Us Better Christians with Mike Aquilina. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome back, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me back, Chris. Here's a guy we say his name every time, I think, when we pray the rosary. When we go to Mass, when we profess our faith, a man named Pontius Pilate, truly, we consider him a villain in the early (laughs) church, don't we? Yeah, we do. Isn't it funny, though, that he's one of only two names of someone other than Jesus uh, mentioned in our creed? Hmm. So he has this elite company. It's only Pontius Pilate and the Virgin Mary who are mentioned by name in the creed. They're the two historical figures that we mentioned, not Peter, not Paul, not any of the apostles, not even St. Joseph, but we mention the Blessed Virgin Mary and Pontius Pilate. So obviously he's a very important historical figure, a very important historical marker for Christians, and he has been in every age. Yeah, we don't even mention Augustus Caesar, do we? No, we don't. No, we don't. In in the creed, we mentioned the Blessed Virgin Mary and Pontius Pilate. So he holds this, this strange kind of fame and permanence in Christian memory. Yeah, but I don't think I'd want to be remembered quite like this. <laughs> and really, it's not just us who remember him badly. Pilate was one of these figures who must have been just a distasteful person, but I imagine he got things done. Because he he had a, a, a position of responsibility. There he was, you know, ruling over, over Judea in this time, over Palestine. And so he must have done something in the military or something in his administrative career to earn the trust of the emperor, to earn this position of responsibility, because he had it. And yet, he's remembered well by no one. The Roman historians remember him with distaste. The Jewish historians despise him, and in Christianity, he's remembered as one of those who are responsible for the murder of God himself. You know, for many people, their knowledge of the person of Pontius Pilate, yes, through scripture, but also through film. And in film adaptations of the the Gospels, The Passion, we see him everything from, you know, a slimy Roman politician to a tortured military leader who is trying to figure out how to deal with these people. I mean, you, you see a whole swath of how they're trying to understand this guy. Yes, yes, yes. And that's because you see all of that drama in the Gospels, the internal drama and the external. There are so many dramatic actions. Pilate washing his hands of the blood of this innocent man. We find his his wife coming up to him and telling him that she had been troubled by a dream about this very man who, who was going to be judged that day. There's a lot of drama packed into that, and he's a complicated figure. And, and I think that that's intentional. What the Gospels want to show us is our common humanity with Pilate. And they the, the Gospel wants to show us that there, the Gospels want to show us that there's no simple villain. There's nobody who's evil incarnate the way Jesus is good incarnate. There are these people who do wicked things, but their motivations are often very complicated. And in their motives, we recognize many of our own. Is he trying to climb a political ladder or or is he just trying to stay, keep some quasi-peace or governance in an unruly area of Rome. 
he may be trying for a better position, or he may be trying just to just to keep the peace in, as you, you said, a very difficult place. There were often religiously motivated rebellions in Palestine because the people were expecting a Messiah to come and liberate the land, call all the, the many tribes home, the dispersed tribes of Israel, call them home so that Israel could rule over all nations. This was a real faith-driven expectation. This was a promise that Israel had received from God, and these people believed it. You know, they accepted God's word. And so often these Messiah figures would rise up and call people to themselves and try to force God's hand. Pilate knew this, and he put down several of these rebellions during his time, and he probably was on the watch for such rebellions quite often. Pilate also did a lot of things that are recorded in the Jewish historians, like Josephus, and even in the writings of Jewish philosophers like Philo of Alexandria. You know, these shockingly insensitive decisions he's made. You know, uh, he, he, for example, confiscated money from the temple uh, in Jerusalem because he didn't think he was getting enough from these Jews. So he sent his troops in to take money. Well, that desecrated the temple these Gentiles who walked in. At another time, he had a regiment come into the city of Jerusalem and not only walk the streets of the holy city, but walk the city with their standards, their military standards, these signs that they held aloft to represent their divisions. Well, how were the divisions represented? By mascots like the boar or by pagan gods, images of pagan gods. And so once again, we have Pilate taking the initiative to desecrate the holy city and insult these people. So Pilate was a man who was insensitive at best, malicious at worst, and must have presented a real challenge to the leaders of the Jews, like Caiaphas, for example, who really were working hard to keep a kind of peace in the land. Yes, it, there is this strong dynamic. We see this when it does come time to bring Jesus before him, where it seems as though Pilate doesn't necessarily want to do what the leaders of the Sanhedrin want him to do. I mean, yes. whether he either doesn't feel it's fair or he just doesn't want to give in to them. That, that again, it's a complicated thing. We, we see that he does not want to be pushed around, and he kind of suspects that's what they're doing. He kind of suspects he's being manipulated. On the other hand, he sees that they're bringing evidence into this that could be used against him and could cause his demise and even his death if he's not careful. So he could be deposed. He could be, his career could be ruined and his life could be ended. This could have consequences for his family. So he's seeing a lot of threats in kind of these veiled accusations of Caiaphas and others. Well, and, and on the other side of that, we hear about his wife. Now, that's unusual. I mean, it the scriptures is. that we're even hearing, we don't know her name necessarily, but we hear about his wife. And we don't usually hear about the, the women in the scriptures unless... It's pretty extraordinary. Uh, and in ancient literature in general, that's what I love about our scriptures is that we find women playing such a prominent role and women exhibiting courage even when all the men fall apart at the end of the gospel. And really, we see this prominence, uh, especially at the time of our Lord's Passion. Who remains with Jesus to the end? Well, it's his mother and the other Marys, the, the women who, who stay with him, who follow him along the way of the cross and comfort him along the way. So we find women taking on this increasingly prominent role the more our Lord is suffering. And here is this strange figure, this Gentile woman who is given this gift of an enigmatic dream that involves this Jesus. Now, you know, it's introduced in the gospel and it's just kind of left there. You know, uh, we see that it really doesn't have that power on Pilate that it should have, although it must have troubled him to some degree, or we wouldn't have heard about it. It certainly troubled her. What's interesting is that in, in some early Christian legends, we find her 
depicted eventually as a convert to Christianity, that she comes to the gospel and then converts her husband, and that two of them are venerated as saints in certain parts of the ancient world. In Ethiopia, for example, and in Egypt in the early church, Pontius Pilate and his wife were honored as saints. Hmm. I did not know that. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? You yeah, again, with all of the villains that we're exploring in this series, I've used the term before, uh, probably more so than I've ever used it. It's this enigma. Yes. It, 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 you, you just cannot make it black and white. The, the Gospels yeah. just won't allow us. Will it? Right. They, you know, we want them to conform to our idea of bad people who do bad things, you know, and yet we see the drag of some innate goodness that tries to to drag them kicking and screaming sometimes to some good end even if they resist it you know we see it there we see some good in them they're complicated figures and these are complicated events and we should not reduce them to mere villainy uh in the lives of any of uh any of these characters the early christians genuinely resisted that and they tried to imagine the conditions of salvation even in the 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 worst of these figures who were responsible to some degree for our lord's death why is that because they knew that they themselves were responsible to some degree for our lord's death that their own sins had killed jesus and that he had died for the sake of their forgiveness. That is something that they had experienced personally. And I'd say that if if we're not seeing that complexity, even in the lives of these villains, in the hearts of these villains, then we're not understanding ourselves really. And we're not even taking responsibility for our own sins that we've committed. We'll return to the villains of the early church and how they made us better Christians with Mike Aquilina in just a moment. Did you know that you can obtain a free app which contains all your favorite Discerning Hearts programs? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Archbishop George Lucas, Father Mauritius Fildi, and so many more, including episodes from Inside the Pages, can be obtained on the Discerning Hearts free app. This also includes all the novenas and devotionals and prayers, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, the Chaplet of St. Michael, and the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady, all available on the Discerning Hearts free app. Visit the iTunes and Google Play app stores to obtain your free Discerning Hearts app today. From the letter of St. James, chapter 1, 12 to 16. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been tried, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no man say when he is tempted that he is tempted by God, for God is no tempter to evil, and he himself tempts no one. But everyone is tempted by being drawn away and enticed by his own passion. Then, when passion has conceived, it brings forth sin, but when sin is matured, it begets death. Therefore, my beloved brethren, do not err. The St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology is a nonprofit research and educational institute that promotes life transforming scripture study in the Catholic tradition. Founded by Dr. Scott Hahn and with current Vice President Mike Aquilina, the center serves clergy and laity, students and scholars with research and study tools from books and publications to multimedia and online programming. The St. Paul Center welcomes you to their free online studies. Whether you're studying scripture for the first time, looking to take your studies to a higher level, or whether you're ready for advanced training, you've come to the right place. In addition, for each track of study, they recommend books that will enhance your study and prayer and build your library of essential works in biblical theology and spirituality. The studies are free. Just visit SalvationHistory.com to view a complete library.
Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, what you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. We now return to The Villains of the Early Church and How They Made Us Better Christians with Mike Aquilina. Probably one of the most compelling questions that could possibly be asked was asked by Pontius Pilate, what is truth? <laughs> yes, and it it uh, it resonates, it reverberates through the ages, you know, because we find that even in our own time, people keep raising that question and scoffing. Mm. Uh, I guess we don't know if he asked that question with any degree of seriousness or if he too was scoffing. It's the question every moral relativist asks, and maybe they're waiting for an answer. Again, the answers are not always simple because, as you said, we just don't know where he was at. Yes. And and, and we're not trying to say his actions are, are good, but I, I think there are, in some ways, not exactly, of course, but in some ways, we can look at our own leaders, our own governors, even those ones who we think they say they're trying to, they're, they're grappling with it, they want to make the right choice, or they and they want to try to make things right, and yet the decisions they're making seem to be so counter truth. Yes. Well, a pilot asked, what is truth? And the answer was standing right in front of him. Mm. Remember, Jesus is the one who says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Everything that Pilate really desired, you know, deep down was standing in front of him saying, I can fulfill everything you want. What is truth? Here it is. We have to make sure that the witness of Jesus is standing in front of people in our own time. When they look at us, they need to see the life of Jesus. They need to see the lives of the saints as those lives are lived out in this time. We have to be committed to living the grace we've received in the world as a witness. People have to be confronted as Pilate was confronted. They might not make the right decisions. Even afterward, Pilate did not make the right decision. But we are required to be Christ in the world because that's what we've been baptized for. In our baptism, we've taken on the life of Christ. In, in the Eucharist, you know, we have his blood coursing through our body. We're living the life of Christ today. We are his hands and feet, as St. Teresa said. We're supposed to be that witness in the world, and it's got to be visible. It's got to be as visible as Jesus was to Pontius Pilate, even if he turned away and refused to see it. Yeah, the indifference. Uh, you Okay, I turn him over. You make the choice, and the crowd chose Barabbas. And yes. he washed his hands. Oh boy, I'm dancing on a line here, Mike, but isn't that what some who have been elevated to a, an authority role have done with their votes in political office? Oh yeah, because you say what is truth? How are we going to how are we going to define truth? I'm going to go with the majority. I'm going to do polls that themselves might be manipulative. Uh, and I'm going to go with what the pollsters tell me to do, and I'm going to justify myself based on that. And and we see where that has led us. We see the kind of chaos that we're living in, and we see a world that's making us unhappy, more unhappy by the day. And we keep choosing that unhappiness. Why is this? Because we will not face the truth. We're like Pilate. We ask the question. We turn away. We don't want to go toward it. And we, we're too cowardly to do what we know to be right. Yeah, that's the key right there. And, it, you know, I mean, it's easy to say 
that, okay, we may look at our House of Representatives or even in the United States, you know, the office of the president or something like that. But what about the office of being a father in your home? Well, that's it, Chris. You're absolutely right. Yes. I, I mean, it's anyone who has any authority and really anyone who has any possibility of, of witnessing the life of Jesus Christ. So that means anyone at all. You know, when we go to the grocery store, how are we looking at others? How are we treating others? You know, when people cut us off in traffic, how are we treating them? How are we responding? Are they seeing Christ in our response? All of this is so important. It's so easy for us to externalize the problem and blame it on our leaders. We are the leaders. Who were the true leaders at any moment in Christian history? Well, it's the people who are doing the right thing. It's the Christians who are living Christian lives because it's the order of grace that's making the difference in spite of all appearances. We've got to believe that. We have God's promises working themselves out through our lives. We got to act that way. Speaking of acts, I do have to say this. How do you find these things, Mike Aquilina, the acts of Pilate? <laughs> I mean, the fascinating reading. I just, I, I, how do you find these things? I'm a nerd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yes. I, I say that in all nerd. loving, uh, an all loving deference to you. Yes, I, I know you. You are a loving nerd. <laughs> I'm a history nerd, but you know what? I have a feeling that a lot of other people will find this stuff fascinating because this is our ancestry. This is our genealogy in the spiritual life. This is where we came from. These mm. these people who lived so long ago, these best-selling books that were published so long ago, this is our background. This is the background radiation of the universe we live in. Fascinating. Why is it? I, I mean, kind of going off topic a little bit here, but why is it that we are, you might see the Acts of Pilate or the Gospels of Judas or something like that, and all of a sudden we give it the weight of of Scripture? <laughs> I, I, what, well, why do we do that? Well, I think that that was a, pa a pattern established back in the 1940s, really, with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, when secularists tried to say, that this was going to disprove Christianity or discredit Christianity. And that never happens. These are books that were not forced out of print by the church because the church was persecuted at the time many of them were first produced. They, were, they went out of print because they were just not as good as the canonical scriptures. They went out of print because they were just not as interesting as the canonical scriptures. So they have a certain value to us. It's not the value of genuine divine authority, like the, the canonical scriptures, like the New Testament, the Old Testament. They have the value of witnesses. What they do is they tell us what certain Christians believed at a certain period of history. And so we can look at it and we can learn something about what the early Christians thought and what they felt and how they tried to understand the figures in the Gospels. And also they can tell us a little bit about how people were living in that time by giving us insights we would not otherwise have. So they have a value, but they're not the same value as, as scriptures. They're not even close. I have a friend who used to say, you know, he'd say, well, am I in the ballpark? He'd say, you're not even in the parking lot. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're not even in the parking lot, these documents. So they, they have a certain value. It's small compared to that of Scripture. But I find it very interesting because they, they talk to us about our ancestors. It's like finding a letter that your great-grandmother wrote to your great-grandfather. And you, you recognize certain things about your family, even in that letter from long ago. Mike, before we leave uh, Pontius Pilate, I have to ask you, you know, I mean, every time I say his name now, whether it's in the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, but I, I can't help but think of that guy who portrayed him in The Passion of the Christ. That's just, he's become my, my Pontius Pilate, as it were. But what should our disposition be? Now that I've read this and I've really absorbed it, even that's changed. I mean, what do we do with that? Well, we want to learn from, from what we see very clearly as his mistakes. We want to learn from what we, we see very clearly as his weaknesses. You know, pa Pontius Pilate was someone who was at best a coward. You know, we don't want to be cowards. And the church, through its ascetical tradition, 
teaches us certain ways to overcome cowardice with the help of the Holy Spirit. And we want to take advantage of the church's tradition in prayer, in our use of the sacraments, in the primacy that we give to God in our lives, in the primacy that we give to our relationship to Jesus. We want to face the truth unflinchingly because that's what Pilate refused to do. We don't want to to act as he acted. I don't want to act like him. (laughs) That's right. So we're going to keep our eyes on Jesus. And we're not going to ask what is truth. We're going to look at him and we're going to say, you are the truth. And we're going to go toward him. I like standing shoulder to shoulder with you, Mike. That's perfect. (laughs) Well, I like it too, Chris. You've been a good friend of mine for so many years. What is truth? It's got a name. It's Jesus. Yes. Yes. Amen. Go toward him. Amen. All right. Thank you so much, Mike. Thanks for having me, Chris. Look forward to the next conversation. You've been listening to Villains of the Early Church and How They Made Us Better Christians with Mike Aquilina. To hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts in cooperation with the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for The Villains of the Early Church and How They Made Us Better Christians with Mike Aquilina.